All right, let's see if this is better. Hopefully we don't get the glitches that we had before. Um, but I don't think it's pretty sad. So as I mentioned before, we're having home church because we can't always meet um, where we currently meet. And I'm up here with my wife in Norway, Michigan, just spending some time alone, um, very needed. And Norway, Michigan, up here in the UP, is having its Leif Erikson um, festival. And the Leif Erikson festival is about Leif Erikson, who lived a thousand years ago from 970 AD to 1020 AD. He was the son of Eric the Red. He actually was a Viking, converted to Christ and Christianity, was won to Christ by the king of Norway, a man named Old King Olaf. And he was the first missionary to Greenland, and he is credited with finding America hundreds of years before Columbus did. And um, so hopefully uh, people remember this Christian brother, and one day we'll meet him up in glory. Time will tell on that. Um, I mentioned the Surgeon General of Florida has declared as of yesterday that the death rate for heart problems in males 18 to 39 has risen 84% and is tied directly to the COVID vaccine, showing that um, within 28 days, it's risen 84%. Who knows how much beyond that? Many people are saying that this vaccine will affect the heart um, for up to two years later, up to five years later, where people just fall over dead. So it's very rare to find a magistrate who's willing to push against the narrative of the elitists. And um, so to see this Surgeon General in Florida declare these things, very encouraging. Um, and remember him in prayer, because I'm sure he'll suffer massive attacks um, from wicked men because of it. Also, I wanted to mention the matter of uh, Russia. We continue to provoke Russia. And um, hey, hon, could you like sit right over here? Mm -hmm. That makes it better for me. <laughs> otherwise, every time you're moving, it's I'm like getting thrown off. So this is so weird being here. But anyhow, here we are. So Russia has been getting provoked by America and the EU and the West, pushed, provoked into you know, doing something that we can then play the victim over and say, look, they started a war and we have to go. We're the ones provoking them. And this is something America has done numerous times in the past. We provoke other nations. Then when they finally respond, we play the victim and use it as a justification to go blow the living daylights out of everybody. So this has been going on for numerous times over um, decades and decades and decades and decades. Um, when it comes to America. So we blew up their um, Nord Stream pipeline, their gas lines down in the bottom of the ocean just a week ago, week and a half ago. And then two days ago, now um, we've blown up their bridge to Crimea. Okay. So understand this isn't just a war between Ukraine and Russia. This is a war between Russia and the entire West. That's what is the situation here. And understand we're the bad guys. We're the ones lying. Um, we're the ones provoking a fight. Understand the people in the West are all the same people who wanted to push this entire pre-tendemic narrative and get everybody this shot. They're the ones who want to use technology in the days ahead to rule every inch of our lives. And... Um, they are also the ones who want to push decadence and immorality on every nation of the world, tying money to getting, if the nations of the world want money from Western nations like America, they have to be all in with homosex, all in with transgenderism. And if they're not, they don't get the money. Okay. So we're not the good guys here. Um, and so our nation needs to be called to repentance. The people of our nation need to be called to repentance. And I don't care about all the good people you know who aren't involved in any of the evil. If they're silent, they're part of the evil. When you're silent, when evil's taking place, you're part of the evil. You have a duty to speak out against it. And um, it's very grievous to me and shameful to be part of a nation 
that has um, really no morality left to it, that are nothing but a pack of liars and money grubbing dogs who want to feast upon all the nations of the earth for their own ends. These are debauched, wicked men who need to be removed from office. So don't tell me about all the Christians and all the good pastors you know. Where are they? Why are there church spires everywhere and this type of filth going on? Because you have a bogus form of Christianity. That's why. And it's grievous to watch. So today, anyway, I'm going to continue on in the book of Second Chronicles, and I want to cover chapter 10. And I want to begin with the reading of the first five verses of this chapter. It says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem to make him king. Uh, pardon me. And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it. He was in Egypt, where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon, that Jeroboam returned from Egypt. Then they sent for him and called him, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy. Now therefore lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. So Rehoboam said to them, come back to me after three days, and the people departed. May God bless the reading of this word. The title of my sermon this morning is Bad Advice for a King and Secession. Let's pray. Lord, we rejoice in you, and we give thanks to you for this time that we have in your word. And I just ask and pray, O oh God, that you help me to set forth that which you give me to declare, that it rallies the hearts of the people towards you to do right by you, to make their lives count for you with the days that you have allotted them. Lord, we see the state of our nation and the corrupts, corruption of it. And Lord, we can learn things here, things that happened long ago in Israel and make application to our day that we do better, that we do right by you. God, I just ask and pray that you would bless the preaching of your word now and be glorified through it. And may men apply it to their hearts. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. So here in verse 1, it says, And Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel had gone to Shechem to make him king. And of course, Rehoboam is Solomon's son. The heir to the throne, Solomon's successor as Israel's king. And he is headed to Shechem. Shechem lay 30 miles north of Jerusalem, in Ephraim on the border of Manasseh. It formed the center of the northern kingdom, the Ten Tribes, and became their first capital after the gathering here with Rehoboam, as things didn't go good here with Rehoboam. We are about to see the splitting of Israel into two kingdoms, the southern kingdom, which will consist of Judah and most of Benjamin, and the northern kingdom, which consists of the other ten tribes. Verse 2 says here, So it happened when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, heard it, heard that Rehoboam was going to Shechem so all Israel could make him king. Um, when he heard it, and then it says in parentheses, he was in Egypt where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. Remember, Solomon wanted to kill him. Okay, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. It says that Jeroboam returned from Egypt. Remember we saw in our sermon in chapter 8, as Solomon wandered from the Lord and began to build his syncretism um, with the false gods of his wives, that the Lord raised up adversaries against Solomon. And this is something common the Lord does. Men are in rebellion against him. He raises up adversaries, both from without and also from within. The ones from within often are the worst, and that's the case here, as we'll see. Remember, 1 Kings parallels the history here in 2 Chronicles. Okay, so you had a writer who wrote 1 Kings, and he mentioned certain things about this era. And Ezra is writing 2 Chronicles, and he's mentioning certain things about this era, and they also parallel each other, saying the same things numerous times. But when you look at 1 Kings, which parallels this history, 
You see that when Solomon went into rebellion against the Lord, we see that God raised up Hadad, the Edomite. That's found in verse 14. Hadad, the Edomite, 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 14, raised him up to cause trouble for Solomon. And he also raised up a guy named Rezin, R-E-Z-O-N, from Zorba, from Zoba. Rezin of Zoba, and that's found in 1 Kings 11, verse 23. And who was the third adversary that God raised up against Solomon? It was Jeroboam, the guy we're reading about here in verse 2, who fled to Egypt because Solomon wanted to kill him. Jeroboam was the third adversary. He wasn't an adversary from without, like Rezin and Hadad were. He was an adversary from within. He was part of Solomon's entourage, and he turned against him. So let's look at 1 Kings chapter 11, and let's pick up at verse 26. And I just want to read this to you to remind you what it was said here. It says, Then Solomon's servant Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite from Zereda, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, also rebelled against the king. And this is what caused him to rebel against the king. Solomon had built the millow and repaired the damages to the city of David, his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon, seeing that the young man was industrious, made him the officer over all the labor force of the house of Joseph. Now it happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem that the prophet Ahijah, the Shilonite, met him on the way, and he had clothed himself with a new garment, and the two were alone in the field. Then Hijah took hold of the new garment that was on him and tore it into 12 pieces. And he said to Jeroboam, take for yourself 10 pieces, for thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon and will give 10 tribes to you. But he shall have one tribe for the sake of my servant David and for the sake of Jerusalem, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel. Remember, we saw that. The reason there's 11 mentioned, the 10, and then Judah, was because Benjamin also went with Judah, the southern kingdom, but not totally. The majority of that tribe did, but not all of them. It goes on and says, because they have forsaken me. This is why God's removing 10 tribes from Solomon. Because they have forsaken me and worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of the Moabites, and Milcom, the God of the people of Ammon, and have not walked in my ways to do what is right in my eyes and keep my statutes and my judgments, as did his father David. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, because I have made him ruler over all the days of his life for the sake of my servant David, whom I chose because he kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand and give it to you. Ten tribes. That would be Rehoboam, Solomon's son. And this is what we're about to see that takes place in Second Chronicles. Goes on, just finishing up here. And to his son, I will give one tribe that my servant David may always have a lamp before me in Jerusalem. There's a city which I have chosen for myself to put my name there. So I will take you and you shall reign over all your heart desires and you shall be king over Israel. This is what God's saying to Jeroboam. Then it shall be if you heed all that I command you, walk in my ways and do what is right in my sight, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as my servant David did. Then I will be with you and build for you an enduring house as I built for David, and I will give Israel to you, and I will afflict the descendants of David because of this, but not forever. Okay, so as we go on, you'll see that Jeroboam, yeah, like so many others, did not faithfully follow the Lord and his awful demise. But here it is. God's leveling the playing field. You live right by me. I'm going to bless you, give you an enduring house, afflict the house of David, if you serve me faithfully. And verse 40 ends here in 1 Kings 11 and says, Solomon therefore sought to kill Jeroboam. Solomon wanted to kill him. That's why he fled to Egypt. As it says, but Jeroboam rose and fled to Egypt to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. Okay, so now we're picking back up here in Second Chronicles 
um, chapter 10, Solomon's now dead, and Rehoboam, his son, is meeting with all Israel to declare him king. And Jeroboam, who received the prophecy of the Lord, returns from Egypt. In fact, there was trouble brewing already. Some did not like the tax yoke Solomon had put on them, and they sent for Jeroboam to return and be at this meeting about Rehoboam becoming king of all Israel. Uh, look at verse 3 of chapter 10 of Second Chronicles. It says, Then they sent for him, talking about Jeroboam, and called him, and Jeroboam and all Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Okay, so there was already trouble brewing. They didn't like the tax yoke Solomon had put upon them. So they bring in Jeroboam, the challenger, you know, um, against the house of David in order to be their representative speaker. And look what it says in verse four. It says, your father made our yoke heavy. This is what the people and their representative Jeroboam say to Rehoboam. Solomon's son, your father made our yoke heavy. Now, therefore, lighten the burdensome service of your father and his heavy yoke, which he put on us, and we will serve you. Amen. The people's representative, Jeroboam, and the people themselves appealed to Rehoboam to do right and lighten the tax load. When you create a bureaucratic tax hell, you know, like America is, and the money falters somewhat, people look for tax relief, which likely was the situation here at Israel's financial provenance would have taken a hit after the death of Solomon, okay? Uncertainty would be in the air. The people wanted some tax relief. The dollar wasn't doing as good as it was. You know, when everything is... Um, going well, people really don't care how much they pay in taxes because there's so much money going around. But when things aren't going well, they want tax relief. And that's what these people wanted. And that was probably the situation there in Israel. They were having their financial prominence wasn't what it used to be because Solomon's dead and uncertainty is in the air. Rehoboam responds that they should return for his answer in three days. Look what it says. So he said to them, come back to me after three days. And it says, and the people repart. So he's going to let them know whether he's going to do what they're asking or not when they come back in three days. But look what happens next, verses 6 and 7. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who stood before his father Solomon while he still lived, saying, how do you advise me to answer these people? And they spoke to him, saying, If you are kind to these people and please them and speak good words to them, they will be your servants forever. This is sound advice. This is really sage advice. And Rehoboam should have received it. But Rehoboam didn't really like the advice. <laughs> he had come to enjoy his standard of living. And he had no desire to see it lessened. Such is the case with all status tells. They feed on themselves, they destroy themselves, they cannot be sustained. So Rehoboam, not liking the counsel of the older men, the elders who had been with Solomon, he decides to consult with the young men, you know, the men he grew up with. He wanted their advice. And of course they lived in luxury and ease and look what it says in verses 8 through 15. But he, Rehoboam, rejected the advice which the elders had given him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him. So these would all have been men who lived in affluence. And he said to them, what advice do you give? How should we answer this people who have spoken to me, saying, lighten the yoke which your father put on us? Then the young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall speak to the people who have spoken to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but you make it lighter on us. Thus you shall say to them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's waist. And now, whereas my father put a yoke, a heavy yoke on you, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. 
So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam on the third day as the king had directed, saying, Come back to me the third day. Then the king answered them roughly. King Rehoboam rejected the advice of the elders, and he spoke to them according to the advice of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to it. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scourges. So the king did not listen to the people, for the turn of events was from God. Remember Ahijah, the prophet, Jeroboam, the ten tribes being taken from Solomon and David's house because of their rebellion against the Lord, Solomon's rebellion against the Lord. The turn of events was from God that the Lord might fulfill his word, which he had spoken by the hand of Ahijah, the Shelanite, to Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. So here we are, right? Here we see the awful work that wealth and ease had done to them, to these young men. Not only did wealth and ease corrupt his father, Solomon, but its ill effects carried on to the next generation. Rehoboam and the young men he grew up with liked their standard of living. They loved their personal peace and affluence, their wealth and their ease, and had no inkling to give it up. In fact, they wanted more. <laughs> their appetite could not be satiated for more stuff, for more wealth, for more ease. Their little finger would be like Solomon's waist. They did not view themselves as the servants of the Lord regarding their civil office. They certainly were not the servants of the people. They viewed themselves as the people's lords and rulers, their taskmasters, complete with whips and scourges. And so is every state as tell, every bureaucratic tax hell you know, so is America here in our day. Go to D.C., see the fortress they've made it into, look at the FBI, America's Gestapo, America's secret police, running around arresting good people, terrorizing the people of America who love the Lord and want to do right by their forebears. The federal government is at war with the American people, and the state governments are their toadies and lackeys, bought off with the federal purse. The arrogance you hear with the tone of Rehoboam and the young men he grew up with is the same tone you hear from those in our government in our day. The government first took from the industrious here in America via taxation and gave it to the irresponsible and lazy. They did this for decades. But now they've bought off everyone with the public purse. They all got boatloads of money via the pretendemic. The federal, state, county, and local governments did. The businessmen did. The educators in their educational industry did. The medical people in their medical industry did. The churchmen in their whore fiefdoms did. The lawyers certainly did. All the people did. And they're all drunk on the money and the wealth and couldn't get their hands deep enough into the state's cookie jar, making sure they got theirs. Everyone is drowning in wealth. All are glazed over and lost their minds like Thorin at the mountain of Erebor. It's all feeding on itself. It's all collapsing. It's all destroying itself. And men must be called to repentance. Here we see the ill effects, the ill consequences of wealth and ease on these young men. But they want more. It feeds on itself. They never can get enough. That's how the state is. The young men couldn't hear the sage advice of the elders. Lighten the load and the people will be your servants forever. They couldn't hear that. The young men had no respect for what is known as life experience. Older men have seen some things, far more things than younger men have seen. They have some life experience. And yes, there's plenty of elderly dopes, plenty of despicable older sots, who couldn't think their way out of a paper bag and who glibly take and take and take from the government trough. But there are always men in every culture and society who see things clearer than others and give sound advice, like these elders did to Rev Bohm and the young men. Sadly, the result here is usually the result of whenever such men speak. Namely, their advice is rejected. The love for wealth and ease went to the next generation from Solomon to his son Rehoboam 
and with far worse consequences. And America is dying on its wealth and ease. A story I love to tell is about um, two of my sons in their window washing business when they were 15 and 17. Me and Claire dropped them off to do this big house. We went around the block. There's a garage sale. And lo and behold, we stop. Because <laughs> any car, the car's stopping if there's a garage sale. My wife's in it. So we go in. My wife's looking at all the debris. A lady picks up a conversation with me. And I share with her, I say, my um, sons are 15 and 17. They started a window washing business. And they're doing your neighbor's house around the block. And she got all freaked out. And she goes, you know, a 15-year-old and 17-year-old, that'll work? And I said, yeah. And she goes, well, let me tell you, I have a 16-year-old, she said. And he never works. And his um, friends never work. They sit around and play video games all day. And she was talking. And all of a sudden, a guy walked up. And he interrupts our conversation. And he says to me, he says, um, pardon me, but did I hear you say that your 15 and 17 year old started a window washing business? And I go, yeah. And he goes, well, I just wanna tell you this, that I think you're an irresponsible parent. And he went on to dress me down for two minutes, how I'm robbing them of their childhood, how these are their best years, and I'm stripping it all away from them, how they should be able to sit around and relax and enjoy these years. So when he finally took a breath after two minutes, I looked at him and I said, to him, I said, do you know how old the youngest Pony Express rider was? Because it's often good to ask a question when you're in a hostile situation. And he had this look on his face. What does the age of a Pony Express rider have to do with what I'm talking about? It was all over his face. And finally he says, no, I don't. And I said he was 11. And many of them were 13. I said, could you imagine how many federal laws they would be violating today if they did that kind of work. And then I went into my two minute screed about how we keep young men perpetually adolescent, never let them risk, take on responsibility, initiate things, grow, contribute to the economy. And his wife's, because that's what I learned at that point, this is his wife was standing behind the woman I was talking to with her hands like this, big smile on her face behind him. That's when I realized this is the woman's husband, and that's why her 16-year-old son and all his friends don't work and sit around playing video games all day. That's what wealth and ease, it's kind of a microcosm of how wealth and ease destroys individuals and then destroys nations, and that's what's happening in America. We are drunk on all the money, all the wealth and ease, being the plantation owners of the nations of the world. It's disturbing to watch. The people love their wealth and ease and the politicians love it too. And they have no compunction about abusing their authority to keep it, to keep the wealth and ease they have grown accustomed to. Even if it brings suffering upon the people, though they will always sell it to the people as helping them. <laughs> and sadly, most people will gladly give up their freedom to the state if the state just cares for them, if the state wipes their butts and blows their noses from the cradle to the grave, an entire nation of dependence, that's what America has become. They rejected Christ's rule and will now learn what a taskmaster the state is. They have rejected God's law and word and will now see what a bowl of porridge statism is. They love their atheism and their apostasism and have made the state God. Both the non-Christian and the Christian have made the state God. The non-Christian through their atheism, the Christian through their apostasism. Statism is the idolatry of our age. And here from history, we see the beginning of Israel's utter collapse. Though it took many years, many generations, to reach its end, it's all rooted in the rejection of the Lord. And look what happens next. Verses 16 through 19. The scripture reads, Now when all Israel saw that the king did not listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What share have we in David? We have no inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to your tents, O Israel, now see to your own house, O David. So all Israel departed to their tents, but Rehoboam reigned over the children of Israel who dwelt in the cities of Judah. 
Then King Rehoboam sent Hadarim, who was in charge of revenue. But the children of Israel stoned him with stones, and he died. Therefore, King Rehoboam mounted his chariot in haste to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day. What happened here in these verses? Secession happened. The ten tribes left. They broke away from Judah and from the house of David. As Ezra writes nearly 400 years after this took place in verse 19, quote, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David to this day, end of quote. To this day, when Ezra wrote, nearly 400 years, still two kingdoms against each other. Secession, listen to me now, secession is rarely peaceful. It is the final stroke. It is the final straw. Men have endured much who break away. And for those they broke away from, they don't give up power without a fight. I have friends who like to talk about peaceful secession. The leftists go their way. The people on the right and conservatives and Christians go their way. Two separate lands. America is no longer the United States. And they are living in a fantasy land. I grew up in Detroit. I know what leftists are like. They have to control every inch of your body. And they have to control every inch of geography in a land. There will be no peaceful secession in America. They are totalitarians. You cannot appease them. You cannot accommodate them. You must defeat them. That's just a fact. You must be prepared to sacrifice and to fight once you pull the secession lever. And there is a time to pull the secession lever. And things are building for that probability to happen in America. Things continue to build every week here in our nation towards that end. Look what happened here, okay? Most secession ends up in a bloody fight. Look what happened here. Look at chapter 11. It says, now when Rehoboam came to Jerusalem, he assembled from the house of Judah and Benjamin 180,000 chosen men who were warriors to fight against Israel that he might restore the kingdom to Rehoboam. But the word of the Lord came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all Israel and Judah and Benjamin, saying, thus says the Lord, you shall not go up or fight against your brethren. Let every man return to his house, for this thing is from me. Therefore, they obeyed the words of the Lord and turned back from attacking Jeroboam. There was going to be a bloody war. The only thing that stopped it was God himself intervening in order to tell Rehoboam and the southern kingdom not to fight against their brethren, Jeroboam and the northern kingdom. Secession will be talked about more in our next sermon. And we'll also see in our next sermons how Ezra recounts both the northern and southern kingdoms continued rebellion against the Lord, both kingdoms, and their ultimate demise. May Christ be praised. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we've had here in Second Chronicles 10. I ask and pray that you would use it for good in the hearts and minds of your people, that they would understand some things. Lord, I ask and pray that we would be faithful to you, that as your people, we would declare good advice, sound advice from your law, from your word, to the governments of our nation and to the men of our nation, O oh God. Lord, I ask and pray that we would fear you, not man, that we would say those things which need to be said, that we would live as men. God, you see the evil that is afoot in our nation, and it has grown strong, and it has been built for decades, and the wickedness is severe. I ask and pray, O oh God, that we would do right by you in the days ahead, that you would guide and lead and glorify yourself and that you would grant repentance among men, that they would turn from the sin in their lives and hate the sins of our nation. 
and that we would see a goodness restored here in the land now known as America. And we ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you all, and I pray you have a good Lord's Day. Again, I apologize for the technological troubles. Um, Handel has assured me that he will take both of these and blend them together so that it'll be one thing. So it might be a couple of days before it's available to share with others. God bless you all. May Christ be praised.